back and of course Mark completely underplayed how valuable he was to me in 2009 in developing um, an AR work which is still one of the you know one, one of the best collaborations I've ever had. Um, uh, I'm really happy to join you all today and just we'll talk a little bit about these two uh, VR works that I've done, VR and XR. Um, the first one, both of them have come about at the invitation of remote Indigenous communities. So there's sort of some particularities to them which may be of interest to you. Um, the first one was uh, these people, the Madu people from Western Australia, who asked me to come and film them. Uh, these women are master hunters and master painters, and they asked me to come and create an immersive work with them, which was really uh, meant to give a sense of uh, being being at home, being in in country, what it felt like for them to be at home in their country. Um, so I went, uh, took another camera person with me, we recorded these women um, as they moved about first burning the country and then hunting in the country. And it was really sitting about the campfire on the first night um, where I happened to mention that I had been to Maralinga where Britain had tested atomic bombs in the 1950s in the South Australian desert. And one of the women at the campfire turned to me which, which with this very fixed view, very, very determined uh, view and said to me, okay, you need to talk to Neri. Um, the sense that I got from the women, I'm just going to show this little clip, which came from our um, relationship with one another, but gives an idea, I think, of what they were hoping to achieve in using, interact in using interactive technologies can probably best be shown by this work. So if you can see here, I videoed the women as they, I actually took still frames of the women as they created this large painting, eight of them together over 10 days, making this painting, which covers a large area uh, where their Bungo community is located. Uh, at this side here where my mouse is, you can see that I'm panning across imagery uh, that the women are painting. This is representing sand dunes and different burning stages. This side here, I'm panning across image satellite imagery, which is covering roughly the same area that the women are painting. And it's this that kind of combination of technologies, which is showing different technologies, which is showing levels of understanding about this country that these women wanted uh, these kind of, let's say, contemporary technologies to be brought in, in order to help them show. So there's this, basically, an understanding that these technologies that we have developed could be used for things that perhaps we have not yet imagined. That really was, I would say, my introduction to the request to bring virtual reality technologies into this community, in particular to meet this man, Neri, who you're looking at now, and to hear his story. Now, Neri um, was walking about in the South Australian desert through a trade route in the 1950s. This is pre-contact. So the Maru people um, are fortunate in terms of Australian history in that they live in a part of the Western Australian desert um, that was not wanted for either growing or grazing. And so they were left alone for a long period of time. And the first contact with the Maru people actually came about in the 1960s. So Neri was moving about in the South Australian desert in the 1950s. This image is taken of him in the 60s. When he saw a thing which he could not understand in terms of his worldview. This is a story that he'd been holding on to since that time, imagining that there would come a time when he would be able to share it with the rest of the world. So all that I was told was this instruction, you have to talk to Neri. And it was in the creation of that painting that you just saw when Neri came into the room and I asked him what it was that he wanted to share. He told me that 
he'd been walking through the desert with his family in the 1950s when they saw a thing that they couldn't name. I asked him, what did you think that thing was? He said, we thought it was the spirit of our gods rising up to speak with us. And then we saw that the spirit had made all the kangaroos fall down on the ground as a gift to us of easy hunting. So we took those kangaroos and we ate them and the water holes boiled and the spirits left. That's the story Neri told me in an art room in Bungal community in 2014. My initial first thought was that I needed to try and create a meeting between these two men, between Oppenheimer, who had developed uh, the capacity for atomic testing in another remote community um, in Los Alamos in Utah, and Neri, whose whole worldview had been torn apart by the seeing of this apparition in his, um, in his land in the 1950s. So I, taking his thinking, began to try and imagine what I could do that would be to give visuals to this idea that he had said, this thing which to him was not an atomic test, he didn't know what it was, it seemed to be a spirit figure. So I began thinking about uh, installation, which I also work in, and tried to imagine how I could create a spirit figure that would match Neri's experience. And this was before I'd actually experienced um, um, cinematic VR, the, where the cameras would allow me to shoot uh, live action. So I held on to the idea that Neri wanted to share this story for, for another year, looking for the form that would best suit his storytelling. And then fortunately was given a residency through Sundance with the company Jaunt VR, who were then operating out of um, Palo Alto and um, was given the opportunity to work with Jaunt to bring their technology, including one of their cameras to um, the, the, the Western Australian desert in order to film this story. So we're bringing new technologies in, we need to, uh, kind of share with the community, which is exactly what happens first. First, a meeting with all of the young people in order that they, I'm just trying to get this to play for you and I'm not sure why it isn't. Um, in order that they can see um, what the technology is and be able to experiment with it for themselves. And then once everyone in the community had tested what this new form was, we put the camera down in front of Neri and the elders. Neri looked at that camera and said, oh, it has 16 eyes. I said, yeah, it has 16 eyes and four ears. So you're gonna to have to be able to tell me how it should Is be what? used, where it should be used and what it can see and what it can't see. So if you go back to that painting I showed you, which if you can imagine was an aerial perspective of the area around Bungal community, um, the, the capacity to think both in incredible close up, but also at a distance and above, which is really what was necessary in order to imagine what these cameras could see was completely natural to the Madhu and, in, and meant that we never shot a single thing that we could not use. We did one scene actually where we brought a drone in and that was too high. Uh, we were testing the height of the drone and immediately people could tell us no, uh, the distance, what that the height of that drone will mean that what is showing from behind is sacred and we can't see it. So I felt that the technology was really the right thing for what the Madhu and Neri wanted to share. At once it gave a sense of presence in the country. Not, it wasn't, it immersed you in place, which is fundamental to this story. Secondly, it gave you a sense of a capacity to feel what it felt like being on that country, which is what I'd learned from my first experience with the women was essential to be able to show. But VR was very new in those days, filmic VR was very new in those days. And the work that I saw did not hold what I would say 
um, appropriate protocols for being able to give such a sense of immersion. So we had to build those protocols into the emerging form. So this, this little piece here. Wife, no longer, Nola Taylor. And me, Curtis Taylor, standing by the gate. This is where I grew up. Hello. Hello. Mary says, welcome. You have come from a long way away. So what I decided to do was to build into the work the same protocols that apply to me to visit this community. I have to be told why I'm visiting. I'm invited to go. I need to be met and welcomed before anything else could happen. And those same protocols were built into collisions. Then we could go about sharing this story that Neri wanted to share, both one about um, Madhu's care for country over generations and the intervention of a technology that destroys uh, both the wildlife and the and 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 everything in its path and the idiocy of of such a technology from the perspective of these people so we did this shoot and as you, as i said to you in the beginning i had this imagining that i needed to construct a virtual meeting between these two men and this is where it happens basically here where where neri gets to meet with oppenheimer it's like a video a virtual experience of Oppenheimer in his own uh, homeland. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says now i am become death the destroyer of worlds i suppose we all thought that one way or another so the virtual meeting allows for then Neri to move to the position of being able to point to Madhu's care for country, which is this um, ca um, custodial burning of country, which you can see here. Neri had held onto this story, as I said, um, for almost, well, it was close to 60 years. He had always imagined, it's not a story that came from his country, it's a story that intervened into um, country that he was moving through. So in a sense, he was waiting to share it back out to the Western world, this, the place where it belonged. He imagined that he would put it in front of world leaders and in particular politicians. And fortunately, in the kind of curation of me by the Madhu to bring, to, to bring this technology in, I have a strong relationship with the World Economic Forum. So we jointly premiered this work both at Sundance Film Festival and here at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2016. Neri left Australia for the first time to attend this event. Uh, the World Economic Forum hosted a live screening of collisions where then Neri and his family members who traveled with him were able to talk about the impact of this historical event on their country. The immersive form I have found extremely powerful for getting in front of very particular audiences, which was our goal with this work, where Neri had a dream to be able to present this sensation of what, what it felt like for him to see this apparition in his homeland, to see these kangaroos destroyed by this event and to bring it in front of politicians, heads of state and heads of industry, including mining industries, in order to give them a visceral physical sensation of what it was he had lived through. So we toured this work, this is the presentation at Sundance. 
it was screened in a theatre, in a, in a live event. You can see now these technologies, thank heavens, we've moved a long way on from with more um, kind of portable technologies. We then were invited to bring it to the UN in Vienna, where it showed at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty meetings. It was brought into private meetings, which is where the technology is particularly useful. This is Hans Blix uh, watching collisions at the UN meetings in Vienna. It became used as a tool then in order to actually give this sensation of what is for many people an abstract concept, a nuclear test. It was seen by Rose Gottemola, who was then the US Undersecretary of State of Arms Control, and she brought it into a forum on arms control in Washington at the State Department. Again, these are small gatherings of powerful people who should they be impacted by what this story is showing to them, have the capacity to create change. It traveled to China where it was seen under this banner of the unintended consequences of our actions and traveled to other forums like this one in, for uh, leaders in Malaysia and ended up in Australia at the end of that year in towards the end of 2016, where we toured it for longer periods of time and finally took it to Parliament House, which was one of Mary's dreams, where it was shown to politicians ahead of a vote that was going to be carried on and for a new resolution in the UN for uh, a new ban on nuclear weapons. And we ended our year at the UN General Assembly where um, the gathered uh, voters on that new resolution were able to come and see collisions ahead of that vote. So Neri fulfilled a kind of imagining of this long held story through the capacity of a new technology to be able to bring sense of what he'd experienced to those people who he most wanted to impact um, because of the power of the technology to place a person within the world of the event. Collisions led to a second work, again at the invitation of another remote indigenous community, the Yawanawa in the Brazilian Amazon, who saw collisions when I was showing it at the Skoll Forum in Oxford in 2016, and saw a capacity in the technology that I had not seen. Yawanawa use ayahuasca as a visioning tool in order to um, solve conflicts, to resolve um, things and to travel in a vision state and they have done this for generations they made an association the head of the the chief of the Yawanawa Tashka Yawanawa made an association between the technology and this visioning possibility he said this technology acts like medicine as in dreaming medicine it opens a portal it carries you without your body to a place you've never been it intensifies color and sound. You meet the ancestors, you are given a message, and then you return. He said to me, my friend, we can use this technology to send a message out. You will have to come to the Amazon. And so the story that Yawanawa most wanted to share was a story of a kind of cultural rejuvenation which had happened really um, following a period of enslavement due to uh, the rubber tapping industry moving into the Yawanawa forest in order to source rubber. The Yawanawa reduced to a small group of around 250 people by the end of the 1970s. They had lost the capacity to do a lot of their rituals. They'd been prevented from speaking their language. They had Christian missionaries there around about the same time. And many of their cultural practices had been, they'd been prevented from or could only carry out in secret. They'd lost a lot of their songs and a lot of their language. This story of cultural rejuvenation they wanted to share came about through these two young women. The one that they that I focused on is Ushawi Yawenawa, who is here, who was trained by the old shaman Tata. Traditionally, women were never allowed to drink the ayahuasca and they certainly were not allowed to become shamans. But this old man in his wisdom 
decided to train the first woman to become a shaman. And when she began to take these medicines into her body, she started to hear songs. And these were lost songs. These were the missing songs of the Yawanawa. She is largely responsible for so much of the cultural rejuvenation that followed for the Yawanawa people. Because when the songs returned, the patterns that went with them also came back and the Yawanawa began to flourish. They were very intent that this old man, Tata, his story of this kind of wisdom, the risk he had taken to his spiritual authority should be able to be shared. And during the time of our, when we were just about to begin filming, Tata took ill and was on his uh, end of his life. So we were asked to send in cameras, which this scene is from, in order that the last moments of Tata could be captured and held inside of this technology. I say this to you in order to explain that in part, there's an opportunity with these technologies to move them, to carry new protocols, but also we need to find new language for what it is we're doing with these technologies. Well, the Yawanawa, when I would ask them what it was that we were showing with these most intimate of scenes, they never use the word film. They talk about a transmission. The technology is an allergist to visioning for them. And they wanted to show Western minds what the capacity for visioning is. In order to do that, I needed to be able to give a sense of what that vision state is like for the Yawanawa. So as Mark mentioned, among we took three cameras, but we also took a portable LIDAR scanner, which to be honest was the most valuable tool in many, many ways. It could scan hundreds of thousands of points of data per second, give us absolutely, completely photorealistic imagery of the Yawanawa forest, but we could decimate that heavy content and create an ethereal view, which is really closer to how the Yawanawa see their forest um, in vision state. I asked what was fundamentally essential to convey. And the Yawanawa said two things. First, that everything is alive. And second, that the forest is aware of you. From that perspective, we were able to use the head tracking of the um, Vive Pro in the Vive Pro in order to be able to impact where the viewer looks. So we could change these points, these data points of the forest in order to have them respond to the viewer's gaze and have that forest do exactly as the hour now suggested it should to respond to where we viewed. I took a scientist with me who I've worked with for many years, the same one who worked on the coral project Mark mentioned, and she was looking for fluorescent species in the forest. And we incorporated this sort of scientific information of these colors that can't be seen except under very specific wavelengths into the Awabana experience. We scanned um, some of the creatures that were important for the imagery and all of these things we used, some of them, that butterfly you just saw, it was like a totem that we used to enter into the world of the work and emerge from it. So the AR component of um, a Wavana, you are looking first of all at a book um, and on that book appears uh, an animation of that butterfly who really leads you into the vision of the story. And we end with Hushahu, who then became this formidable shaman. We end with seeing her doing ceremony inside uh, the Yawanel forest. Here, 
you can see the kind of workings with some of the content which I wanted to show you. So this is the decimation of those, um, the LIDAR content in order that we could use, um, that we could kind of give this vision sensibility to it. Uh, this is Tashka, the chief of the Yao now had to catch traveled to Culver City in LA where I was making the work in order to check that everything um, was appropriate in terms of the way that we were displaying this experience of visioning from this story. I didn't want the work to be one that just rested, like traveled viewers to the Yawanawa forest and created a disconnect from our from our reality only back into the Yawanawa forest. So we worked with Skada and did a volumetric capture of Hushahu, which, which meant that we could use this um, AR component of Hushahu at the end of the work so she could travel back into our reality with us. So this um, imagery of Hushahu where you see here, where she's doing the same sort of breathing that the Yawanawa do was a cleansing motif travels back to you, with you, at the end of your vision um, experience of the Awavana work. And this um, volumetric capture of Hushal who lands in your reality at the end of the experience. This is to give you a sense of how we incorporated some of those um, content from... I saw what my father and Tata had been seeing. I'm just going to scoot along. Oh, that everything. Some of the capture that is we alive. had gotten of the uh, creatures, but also you'll see us move into the lidar. And into this kind of vision state. We also use photogrammetry. If it, it so, we had a kind of various components that we needed to be able to pull together seamlessly and moving between these elements, this beautiful vision state and um, the live action was sometimes challenging. I'm going to show you this transition because it gives you an idea of the sorts of things we had to ima imagine and then be able to bring about. So how do you move from one very particular technology into another technology? You have to think very creatively about um, transitions in order that you get sort of a seamlessness around that doesn't disturb the viewer's experience. Oh, so well let me see if that's not going to play but you can see here i'm in the lidar state and what you can see approaching is a video ball and that video sphere comes towards you and then encases you so we have to use very creative transitions in order to be able to move the viewer in and out of these different um, uses of technology I wanted people also to retain a connection to the Yawanawa forest once they'd ended this experience. And so we worked on an AR uh, bracelet. The women made these bracelets, which incorporated the butterfly motif um, that, as I said, is a kind of, was, was one of our um, like constant references. And um, we worked with Blipper in um, the US to create this AR view where when you look through your phone at the bracelet, the butterfly appeared on, um, on the bracelet. We connected the butterfly to content um, that was observing deforestation and forest fires in the Amazon and the butterfly uh, her, the, the quality of her pet of her wings um, changed according to increase of forest fires and deforestation. This is a kind of setup for a Wabana, as you can see, in an installation environment. And you'll see there the book that I talked about, which is the kind of portal that brought you from AR into live action and through to um, the other scenes of the work. And we made it as much as possible feel comparable to a Yawanawa um, um, hut experience. I worked with a perfumier uh, from Aesop in order to develop a scent from the Yawanawa forest. And when people emerge from the experience, they came to this. Oh, that's telling me that I should stop speaking. 
came to this space where you could smell the scent of the forest, but we had these books present for people to write and basically decompress after their experience of the of being with Hushahu in this world. And for the Venice Film Festival, we brought a second component, which was a walkthrough of those of the LIDAR forest. And for that, as an activation, we used breath. So we heightened the capacity of the microphone in the headset. And when you walked through the LIDAR forest, as you breathed, you dispersed those um, small particles of light in front of you. So that that sensation that the Yawana most wanted to give of an impacting um, that forest uh, by our presence was able to be given through um, the walkthrough technology. So that work again premiered in Sundance. Um, it went to the World Economic Forum. It went to the General Assembly in the UN and continues to travel. And I guess, you know, I, I would just affirm the power of these technologies, one, uh, to give a sense to worldviews that maybe are not familiar to the Western mind um, and to be able to share different ways of being through the intimacy and power of the form. Um, that's been my experience of using them and I'd love to talk with you more about it now. So I'll stop sharing my, uh, my screen. Thank you, Lynette. That was lovely. So inspiring. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through. And also, if anyone asks questions in the room here, you can ask them or um, send on Slido as well. Oops. Um, you can see us. You can see the room now, Lynette. There's all the people here. There we go. Yeah. Um, but there's two other rooms as well. So it's about 100 people. So one question I had, uh, first of all, is are you most interested in the capture of live action or are you more interested in creating experience in other modes of VR and AR? And you, I guess you've shown examples of both, you know, 360 movies and now the VR experiences with the, um, um, in the Amazon. So, um, so the question is, are you mo more interested in capturing the live action or interested in capturing experiencing or creating experiences in other modes of VR and AR? I mean, I come from a really, I would say, an immersive documentary um, position, and I'm I'm super interested in um, in live action, and I guess everything that is uh, largely in largely everything that's in a wavana has come from life itself. So um, I'm interested in the the way that the technologies can can create immersive experience but um primarily i take everything from life if i can which is why i would just say bring a scientist with me for those sort of captures I'm more interested in that than i i can't imagine myself you you know moving sort of primarily into all generated imagery there's something about the live action that i um I really do love and having people in front of a camera and the capacity that they have then to address the viewer directly in VR is and XR is extremely powerful. Great, thank you. And the next question is, um, um, the person is basically asking, what should be the, the reason for filmmakers to choose between a standard 16 by nine format or a 360 format? How does it make an immersive difference to the story? I mean, I use a lot of different forms. I would say uh, the, for me, the way that you would choose is if this, if what needs to be shared cannot be shared in any other form um, than, than VR, then that is the form that it should be in. So, so I can move across forms. I've made feature documentaries and I work in installation. I work in full dome. Um, I would find this the experience that needed to be shared in exactly that manner. Um, and with these works, that was the case. There's no way I could give you the sense of what it felt like to stand in front of a nuclear test um, in the middle of a desert and try and understand what was happening, except by placing you there. 
And the same for a wavana. I can't give you a sense of what the Yawanawa see in vision state and the way they perceive their forest, except by giving you the capacity to see it for yourself, which I can do in VR. Um, by making that a parallel experience by 16.9, which is sitting separate to you, you can see it and you will look at it, but you won't be seeing it for yourself. And so for me, it's always the decision try and find the perfect marriage between the story and the form. And I uh, will take a long time until I find the right technology. I think, as I said about collisions, I knew about that story two years before I found the technology that was right for it. Mm, really great. Um, does anybody have any questions in the room here? Very quickly. Yeah, Mari, can you hear me Lynette? Yeah. Um, just a very, very quick question and no pressure, but uh, this comes from a conference where there are some Maori people gathered. And they're looking at the doctrine of discovery, um, which basically gave permission for Christians to move across the world and take land and kill people, and also the justification for slavery. Um, and so they've been to the Vatican several times to get the papal bulls revoked. But they were established in 1470 and whatnot. So uh, you've got um, connections in high places. I'm just wondering if you've got any connections at the back. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, perhaps you can you you write to me about what it is that you're exactly wanting. Um, I'm always happy to help if I can, and particularly around that story and that I'm history. Sure, I'm sure. mm -hmm. um, right. So I have one question. I th what really strikes me about your work is that um, you're taking technology and then you you're basically invited by people who are in the regions to um, bring technology and then tell your stories. But the technology you're bringing is people haven't really experienced before. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that process of discovery was like when people, you know, the Aranawa, for example, saw their first VR or, and, and was it out of a co-creation experience where they provided ideas back to you about how this technology was brought? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of pre-planning and a lot of conversations that are occurring beforehand. So, you know, I'm showing you those production shots of when we we're in the forest, for example, but we had meetings beforehand. So um, in order to discuss what the story should hold, um, what the technology is meant to be able to be doing for them. It's very, um, it, it's all of the work I do, I would say is based on real relationship. I don't do a lot of work. So, I, uh, I, you know, I do one work every year or every couple of years. And um, so the preparations are what I spend a huge amount of time on so that I'm understanding exactly um, what it is that is, um, but say with the young now we're wanting to be conveyed and in then in in that sense yeah it's like an enormous collaboration based on trust and relationship um there the the the, the thing that i'm interested in i think as i said um is that the yawa now saw something in the technology that i hadn't seen and that's how they wanted it to be used that they could see something that could show you a way of perceiving the world that you would in a vision state. I hadn't thought about VR as a portal that could open you to transcendent experiences, but it seemed a natural fit once they said it. So in, in a sense, it was the concept that Tushka came up with that then I needed to fulfill. Um, and I do, we do a lot of talking. There's, there's a lot of, um, conversation and then I have to draft to synthesize all of that down into a narrative which can hold up in say 17 minutes but at every point I'm going back and asking is this okay how would we do this is this a way to do this for example I can tell you I saw you we moved into you saw we moved into the grandmother tree the salmoma tree as something that was possible to do the technology allows us to do that is it something that should be done? I can't know. All I can do is show it to the Yawanawa and ask, is this something we should do? And, um, and, and that's the way the work evolves. It's, it evolves through a process of basically it's pushing, the pushing on the technology and seeing how it can match this fundamental concept, which is um, the forest is aware of you. That's great. Um, one other person asked, um, don't you think the accessibility of the VR and other gadgets will be a barrier for communicating your story to a large and non-digital audience? So for example, 
to see Averina, you have to have a fairly high-end VR system to experience it. So people who don't have that system um, won't necessarily get that same experience. Well, two things, like I said, I, I totally agree. It's in it's it's not terribly accessible at the moment, but I've worked in new technologies for uh, several decades now, and I know the trajectory of new technologies. If they're going to hold up, and I believe VR will, they become more and more accessible and, and able to be used by many people. And um, while you might build a work that has to be shown in a Vive Pro or a Vive, which a Wavana wa was, gradually as the technology changes, you can shift it into more and more portable forms. Right now we show a Wavana in a Rift S and I'm hoping for the time when we can just port it into something like, you know, uh, a standalone Oculus, which will happen as the technologies develop. So that's one thing, just because you, if you're thinking of the longevity of your work, you're not just building for this moment and the technology of this minute, because as we know, the technologies change very quickly. Secondly, I pitch my work to particular audiences, and that is part of the intention of the impact of the work. And I have found that pr the privacy and intimacy provided by a headset is very powerful when you put it on the head of a very important person and they are locked off for a period of time inside a world that they have not known and may never go to. And by exposing them to that, I think there's capacity there that I couldn't get otherwise. And I'm very interested in affecting change. And if that may, means that my audience is the size of one person for, for a screening, that doesn't matter to me. If that is a person who can make a difference um, around Yawanawa um, preservation of their forest. That's fantastic. Thank you. Is anybody else got any questions? Um, I uh, just one last question. Um, of course, in New Zealand, we've got our own um, Indigenous um, people. You know, we're doing some project work with, with Maori tribes around the country. Do you have any advice for um, how um, you know, people should be working together in that setting as well, based on your own experiences? The only thing I would say is to th uh, my my experience, my uh, advice would be think long term about the way skills, um, the skills of using the technology can be built into all into communities. This technology has been developed in a vacuum. The benefit would be to find as much diversity as possible in amongst the storytellers and those. And that means who has access to the, the products that allow us to produce the work. So um, I'm always trying to think of how do we leave technology behind in order that future works can be done so that there's kind of a sharing of the technology, there's a learning around the process and that there's a leave behind um, so that future works can be created. And so I think for me, it's about thinking long-term, not just about this current work, but the works that can continue to happen down the track. It's awesome technology. Um, and so it's really about as many diverse voices as possible having access to it. Great, well, thank you, Lynette. Let's thank her again. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for sharing um, your time and we'll jump off now. So. Um, let me just um, disclaim. Thank you, Lynette, and have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.